vai 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 não vou vai 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 não vou vai 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 não vou vai 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 não Tonight on Dream Spaces How Sinky puts the inn into Finland. The future for London's last power stations. Offices so cool they make you want to go to work. And Mark Radcliffe on why the Lowry is better than lard. Thanks to these things, Finland has recently undergone a massive image change. Nokia are responsible for more than one third of the world's mobile phones. And not content with just bringing us a text message, the Finns are now totally reshaping their capital, fit for the digital revolution. The new office blocks use glass and steel, not Scandinavian pine. But corporate chic is only the latest phase of Helsinki's long love affair with modern architecture. Ah! Fine design has long been a matter of national pride. Finland's on the margins of Europe and Russia. Bold buildings are a way of grabbing the world's attention. One of the earliest was Ariel Saarinen's Central Station, opened in 1919. It's straight out of a movie. But the main man of Finnish architecture is Alvar Aalto, the most famous Finn since Huckleberry. It's worth the trip to Helsinki for his work alone. He's all over town, even in the old city. Okay, so... It looks a bit like the kind of office building you'd find in Reading. And yet, Alto's buildings don't really shout love me when you first see them. But his genius lies in material, detail and proportion with Alto. It's all about subtlety. Decades of piss-poor rip-offs make it harder to spot just how good this building is. I love the bronze panels which have weathered to green, the contoured handles, and the use of stone and water. Right in the heart of Helsinki is Finlandia Hall, which Alto finished just before his death in 1976. The interiors are lit by a mix of natural light from huge light wells and 35 types of lamp, all of which he designed himself. There are strokeable textures all over the building. Tactile tiles, leather wrapped handrail, woven horsetail, In the concert hall, Alto gets epic. The monumental balconies are like layers of rock. The ribbed walls are supposed to remind you of pine forests. Well, they're supposed to. Finlandia Hall really sums up what's best about Alto's work. It's huge, but like all his buildings, it's very personal and very human. That's not easy, and that's what makes Alto a great architect. But Helsinki is not a one-horse town. This is the rock church, so-called because it's built in a rock. But there's also a hint of prog rock about it. It's so 70s. It was hollowed out by brothers Timo and Tuomo Suomalainen. One piece of copper wire 22 kilometers long was coiled round and around to make the UFO ceiling. When the Finnish love of design is combined with the Finnish love of booze, you end up with some very sexy bars. One of the best looking is Pravda. It's a place to be seen, and it's easy to be seen in the glass fronted toilets downstairs. But boys, just zip up before you leave the cubicle. Teatri is a huge complex of bars, a restaurant and club. The interior is by a Brit, Rupert Gardner, and it's rammed full of Helsinki smart set, including the mobile millionaires. The menu's international fusion, not fillet of reindeer. But what's best is the lighting design. Colors ebb and flow through the walls and curtains, transforming the space while you eat. 
For a city of only a million, Helsinki's got a cracking club scene. There's one upstairs at Teatri where the design is again impressive, even if the music smells of cheese. Maybe being tasteful all the time just gets too tiring. It's midsummer, it's two o'clock in the morning, and it's still light. It is very easy to party in a city that never gets done. To cure a Helsinki hangover, sweat it out. The Finnish love of saunas is no cliche. This one was designed by Rima Pietila, one of Finland's greatest post-war architects. He's given the traditional log cabin a cool, contemporary edge. The crucial part of any Finnish sauna experience is this. Hitting yourself with birch leaves. This is quite nice. And if you can't stand the heat, get out of the sauna. Just take a plunge into the lake. More fun in summer than winter. Back in the center of town is Helsinki's Museum of Contemporary Art, Kiasma, which rivals the Guggenheim in Bilbao as the world's most eye-catching gallery. Stephen Hull's delirious design is even better than London's Tate at tempting you onwards and upwards through its galleries. You're always curious to see what's round the next corner. It also makes perfect use of natural light. It's a shame that the architecture is sometimes better than the art. Kiasmo shows that in Finland, great architecture didn't end with Alto. And with loads of buildings going up all the time, it means that Helsinki is definitely one of Europe's best looking cities. Last century, London's electricity was supplied by 28 power stations stretching the length of the Thames. By 1982, only Greenwich and Lotts Road were still in action. The rest were either demolished or left to decay. Bankside was the first to be redeveloped. It lay empty until 1994, when it was acquired by the Tate Gallery, who commissioned the Swiss architects Herzog and de Miron to transform it into the hugely successful Tate Modern. But there's still two more left for redevelopment, Battersea and Lotts Road. Until it closed last October, Lotts Road powered most of the London Underground. The site is now part of a half a billion pound developer-led scheme which aims to create a new urban quarter. The plan is to build two residential 30-storey towers on the riverfront, with the power station made into luxury living units. Battersea Power Station used to be known as the Temple of Power, but since its closure in 1975, it's been the subject of highly charged controversy. Previous bids to redevelop it have failed. No major work has been done to this building since 1989 when the roof was taken off. But plans for the 36-acre site have finally been agreed. There'll be two 600-room hotels, a conference centre, housing, a new jetty and a theatre. The power station itself will become a covered leisure complex full of shops, restaurants, and offices. So how long will the construction period be and when can people sort of start enjoying this 21st century part of London? <laughs> well, once the enabling works has been completed, which should be um, uh, within two years, the construction period is uh, anticipated to start and uh, we anticipate that will take uh, approximately 36 months. So wow. not long, not long wow. to wait in the history of this building. 
There may be times, though, when the unforeseeable does happen. Something big and unexpected. Something which is far beyond normal. And then... This is the control room. This is the one room which is going to be retained in the new proposed scheme. It's a fabulous example of the age, really. The engineering and the kind of architecture are married together to make this fantastic Art Deco structure. You can see this fabulous stonework, the skylights with their metalwork detailing, these incredible lamps, and the care that's been taken with all the engineering equipment, where you see these beautiful dials which are placed perfectly articulated on this long wall. There's a real sense of grandeur, and I can just imagine what it was like to work here. When Jules Wright bought this derelict power station for four million pounds, she wanted to retain as much of the original interior as possible. The result is an imaginative restaurant and exhibition space called The Whopping Project. Why did you decide to sort of leave the building sort of more or less? It looks like it's in the state that it was. When well, I spent four million pounds on this. I can assure you it's not in the state that it, well, it's not in the state that it was. Okay. However, <laughs> having Sorry. taken that insult, um, <laughs> however, I would have liked to have done absolutely nothing to it. Right. The restaurant is a plugged-in fusion of past and present. The food is modern, the furniture contemporary, and there's only Australian wine on the menu. It's all a big contrast to the old engines and pipes. It doesn't fight the power, it feels it. This is the boiler house, and you can still smell the coal in here. This place feels really contemporary, theatrical and old at the same time. The details are really sensitively done. It's really, really raw, and I love it. I fell in love with it from the moment I walked through the front door mm -hmm. because it was like work, walking into a film set. <laughs> when I walked into this building, mm. there was a sense of people being here. And I think the, the proportions and the shape and the feel of these buildings mm. is rather like an industri they're industrial churches. Mm. And at some level, people of all kinds, all backgrounds, all classes, <sighs> experience that sensibility. The sheer size and scale of these power stations make them unique sites. Tate Modern and the Wapping Project have proved they can become cool, creative spaces. As an architect, I hope Battersea and Lots Road can build on that success and show as much imagination. The lines of the Villa Savoie look as fresh today as when it was built in the 1930s. Its creator is the most loved and loathed. Each apartment has this double height space inspired by a monk's cell. The rough concrete of the Unité's base points to a new phase in Corbusier's thinking. The Chapelle Notre Dame du Haut in Ronchamp has been called poetry in concrete. It's cute, curvy, and a far cry from the machine-inspired boxes of his early career. Like all his buildings, it asks to be explored. There are funnels here, like at the Unité, but these capture light and filter it down. Corbusier's been widely copied, usually by less talented architects, his reputation has been tarnished by scores of shoddy imitations which litter council estates and cities around the world. But despite this controversial legacy, Le Corbusier revolutionized architecture in the 20th century and his influence continues well into the 21st. When I think of modern offices, I think of drab, open-plan rooms in Slough, crammed full of David Brents. But does it have to be like this? Will the office ever become an enjoyable place to work? 
One of the most uninspiring office environments is the call centre. There's not much company loyalty and people don't stick around for long. So a company in Swindon decided to do something completely different. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Not so bad, come through. Thank you. So Paul, how long have you been in this building? We moved in in January 2000. Um, we really needed to, to be in a purpose-built building. And I think there was a need for the company to have some sort of identity and we really wanted a building to sort of, to show that. And I've heard about um, some of your treats around the building. We have ladies in 1950s um, trolley dolly outfits running around with motorised trolleys, going in between desks, giving everyone tea and coffee and offering sandwiches. Um, our reception desk that we've got here is you know, specifically designed and built. We'd like people to enjoy working here and, it, uh, and we also want to create you know, obviously a bit of interest about the company via what we do sort of thing. Most of the people who work here are in their early 20s, so the architect designed the toilets to look like nightclubs. Very good for doing your makeup though. The fountain's unique too. The height of the water mirrors the height of the lift so you can tell which floor it's on. How long have you worked in this building? In this building since it opened uh, last year, so when it opened. And your girlfriend actually works here as well, doesn't she? She does, yeah. She's down the end there. So it's a real sort of family thing going on. Well, I don't know. We've had, uh, we've had um, comments about things that go on in the building. But... Yeah, no, I was going to say, because the toilets, I mean, some of them look like saunas. It's, yeah. It must yeah. be tempting to just sort of... Take your clothes off yeah, and relax. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It is very tempting sometimes, but... But you manage to avoid it. <laughs> You've got to, you've got to be professional, yeah, Enough exactly. Size. This building is a great example of design that works, but you don't have to use seven million pounds. Richard Palmer needed a little bit more space, so he just did it using furniture. Richard created office high chairs which sit at a two metre high desk, cleverly separating the desk from the meeting area. Nothing. Hi Richard. Hi. So I take it that you don't suffer from vertigo? Uh, not particularly, no. That's quite lucky because we're pretty high up here, aren't we? About two metres. So I take it you've got a bunk bed at home? It's funny because I'm a twin and uh, yeah, I used to have a bunk bed. Oh, that's good. <laughs> so maybe that's it, subliminally. So did you invent these? This was totally your idea? Yeah, I mean the chair itself is a standard um, Herman Miller product, but the, the structure and the rest of the layer and the design is all ours. The original inception is to try and segregate the space, but it works much better than we imagined and somehow you don't feel part of what's going on down there and conversely they don't feel that you're part of what's going on, so you do actually very quickly separate. And there was absolutely no desire to get secretaries and miniskirts up here. <laughs> so far the office spaces I've seen have all had a very different feel about them, but what if you need something that's a bit more flexible? The e-office is right in the heart of Soho and it is the ultimate in rented office space. Loaded with all the latest gadgetry, this isn't just an office. It's an image designed to show your clients just how cool you are. There's loads of cool stuff in here, but check this out. There's also video conferencing and for those stressed out moments, a mini bar. This is the coffee breakout area. I really like the little design touches. I think the space feels really good for it. The art is by trendy reportage photographers. And the dinky paperweights are designed by Alessi. Mobile phones and laptops have made it possible to have a meeting almost anywhere, but you still need a space to do it in. It's inflatable, and it's called the cloud. The cloud is a prototype for a new kind of portable office space. 
It was shown at last year's Milan Furniture Fair. It fully inflates in five minutes to create a self-contained bubble. The point of the cloud is that you can use it anywhere as long as you've got power handy and it's not raining. Wow. Well, it definitely creates a kind of surreal space. Which is quite unusual. I don't think I've ever felt anything like this before. The light reminds me of being under the sheet in the morning. It's kind of a strange perspective in here as well. It's a bit disorientating, actually, if anything. It's interesting. Although the cloud is a bit gimmicky, the redesign of the office space has come on a long way. But is it the milk of human kindness, or is it just a subtle plan to get you to work harder? See if your boss buys you more than just a new desk and swivel chair on Monday morning. The Lowry is an art complex housing Salford City's collection of paintings by L.S. Lowry. Everybody knows Lowry, but uh, just for the odd thicko, matchstick men, right? The council wanted to build something for the millennium, which would regenerate the areas where he lived and worked. And this is what the architect, Michael Wilford, came up with. The first time that I saw the Lowry, I was just really blown away by it, because I thought it was just interesting that someone would choose to make a building of a series of geometric shapes. And I just thought that that was really bold. It looks very solid and quite forbidding. But when you get up nearer, it's like mesh, and you can start to see through bits of it the more you approach it. And I just think that that's a really interesting concept. Like a high-tech string vest. So when you get close to the Lowry, what I really like is that the colour starts to draw you in. From the outside, there is no real colour. So it's all the steel and the greys and quite neutral. You expect kind of big white walls and chrome, but very soon it, you get these oranges and yellows and purples. And I like the juxtaposition between the kind of quite forbidding and neutral outside and the warmth of the colours on the inside. The architect, Michael Wilford, he wanted to put some colour on the outside. But I think it really works. The sort of almost blank canvas nature of that stainless steel skin, I think it's better not broken up by colour. The floors sort of peel away like the layers of a psychedelic onion. There's ramps going in different directions at different levels. And um, I think that's a pretty good idea for a building like this because it, it keeps you moving, it keeps you inquisitive as to what's around the next corner. Um, if indeed it was a corner, more likely to be a bend in here. The idea of the building reminds me of Lowry's paintings. They have a lot of grim up north cliches, grey skies, factory chimneys, flat caps, all that kind of thing. Um, but once you get close to them, you see there's a lot of affection in there, a lot of love of the surroundings and the landscape and the people. And I think that's the same with the building. Cold from a distance, but as you approach it and get inside, you realise it's much warmer than you first thought. But the heart of the building is this theatre. The Lowry is one of the largest theatre spaces the North can offer. And apparently loads of big names like playing this theatre because the acoustics are amazing. And the seats are dead comfy. Apparently they're designed by the same people who make the seats for Ferraris. The first time I came to Salford was uh, on a school trip, be about 10, I think. And then it was still very much a thriving docks. And I was really excited to come and see, you know, there's a cliche about ships from all over the world. And uh, the next time I came was to live here, really. And the, the world I remembered as a kid had entirely vanished, where there was sort of 
200 cranes. There was two left as just kind of totemic symbols of what it used to be. Still the striking feature of the Lowry is that sort of stainless steel skin it has. And I think that it's a masterstroke really because it, it does give it a kind of presence, a kind of zing, a kind of, I don't know, pizzazz. Even on the dullest days, and even the most hard man CUNY will admit we get quite a few of those, it still looks impressive, doesn't it? And it just lends it a chameleon-like quality, so the building, even though it's quite hard shapes, does seem to get harder and softer depending on the time of day and the weather. Another thing that I like about the Lowry is that they haven't pretted it up too much outside. There must have been people who said, well, it's a bit cold, let's put some gardens or water features in or buckets of flowers or hanging baskets. It was basically an industrial space and the building has reflected that. There's a nod to its industrial past in the construction and design of the building. I think in some ways the Lowry really comes alive at night. You've still got the boldness of the structure. It's still a real force, a real presence. And yet, because of the lights, you can see some of the fragility of it, some of the structure and the struts inside. And as a symbol and a statement of what Manchester is in the 21st century, I think it really works, and I'm really glad it's here.